So what is the Gibbs phenomenon? And it's best explained by looking at an example of the square pulse shape in the time domain, which has a Fourier transform of a sync function. And of course, the Fourier transform shows us all of the frequency components that add together to make up our time domain signal. So let's consider for a moment if we didn't include all of the frequency components because this sync function goes to infinity. So let's consider if we had a band limitation on this uh, sync function in the frequency domain. So let's uh, consider the band limitation over this frequency range, for example. Uh, and this means that we are going to include all of the frequency components within this limit here, this bandwidth, uh, which we're going to call W, and we're going to exclude all of the other ones, which means we're setting them equal to zero. So we're multiplying these two functions in the frequency domain. So if we multiply in the frequency domain, then we convolve in the time domain. And for more information about these Fourier transforms and the properties of multiplication and convolution, uh, you can check out the links below this video where you'll find many more videos on the channel. Uh, but if we multiply these two in the frequency domain, then we get this convolution in the time domain. Well, let's look at what that gives us. Well, this function here, the square function in the frequency domain, because of duality, uh, it has a time domain which is a sync function. Uh, and so we get a sync function in the time domain from this filter, which is filtering out the high frequency components. And so when we get the convolution in the time domain, we're going to get a convolution of the square with the sync. And what we're going to get is a function that looks like this. And I'm going to try to draw it uh, fairly much uh, just by freehand here, but um, it's uh, as close and accurate as I can in freehand. So this is from convolving these two equals this uh, because we have multiplied these two in the frequency domain. So in the frequency domain, we have this function here, which goes up until that and it gets multiplied by zero outside. Uh, and that's the function that we have uh, as a result of multiplying in the frequency domain by cutting off all these high frequency components. So if they're not included in the signal, then instead of having a square function in the time domain, we're going to have a function that looks like this, where there's these overshoot. And we, we, the, this is the important thing for the Gibbs phenomenon is to start looking at this overshoot that happens. So let's just, before we get to the exact Gibbs phenomenon, let's look at one more bandwidth which is a bit wider than this. So let's consider an even wider bandwidth. If the bandwidth is wider in the frequency domain, then the signal in the time domain, will, this will have a narrower sync function in the time domain. And then because it's got a narrower sync function in the time domain, when you convolve the square with this narrower one, so I'll just draw some dashed lines across here. So this is case the first case uh, here, and the second case that we're looking at here. So now if we're going to convolve with this function with this one here, we're going to get a function which is going to look sharper, where the uh, this overshoot happens more quickly and then it dies down to a sharp, uh, to a more flat top there. And then there's the overshoot that happens here in the time domain. So. Here we are comparing these two. So if this one, if we allow a narrow bandwidth, so we cut off lots of the high frequency components, then we'll get a smooth signal like this with quite a bit of overshoot. And if we allow more frequency components, so we're cutting off less of them, then we get a sharper response. Uh, and this, these uh, functions here you should be able to see because this is a wide sync function and this is a narrow sync function because if you make it wider in the frequency domain, you make it narrower in the time domain. Okay, so this is uh, sort of clear, and let's think about the limit of this. So if, if we made this bandwidth go to infinity, then we're including all of this frequencies, then we get this function here. So we, we're moving, as we're, in, as we're broadening out and including more and more frequencies, more of the frequency range, then we are reducing the amount of this, uh, of the, of the, ti of the uh, time range of these oscillations. And it's natural to think that you would also be reducing the overshoot. And this is where we come to the Gibbs phenomenon. So it turns out that you do not reduce the overshoot. So this overshoot 
range here is the same regardless of the bandwidth, and that is the Gibbs phenomenon. And that's an interesting result, somewhat surprising result, and it was certainly surprising when it was first, uh, first discovered. Uh, so as you increase the bandwidth, you do get these oscillations uh, becoming sharper and they, they come to a flat uh, across the top more quickly when you're inclus including more of the frequency bands. You get a better approximation to the square wave. Uh, so that's one way to think of it. You're, getting, you're including more frequencies, you're getting a better approximation to the square wave. However, the amplitude overshoot does not decrease, and that's the Gibbs phenomenon. So why is it that this amplitude overshoot does not decrease? Because, you, because in the, finally in the limit when you incre include all the frequencies, you don't get any overshoot. At least that's the, it, it does converge to this exact square function. So how can it be that this overshoot is not decreasing as you're increasing the bandwidth, but that in the limit you do actually get the square wave with no overshoot? So let's try and explore this and try to understand this overshoot. And we'll do it by uh, looking at what is actually happening here as you are convolving uh, these two functions here. Okay, so let's look, let's take our square waveform here uh, and our square waveform in the time domain. And we're going to convolve it. I'm going to draw the, the steps of the convolution for this first example here. So let me draw the two functions that are first, well, first of all, when you're convolving these two functions, we keep one of them constant. So this is the function here that we're going to keep constant. Uh, and if, for more information on convolution, again, uh, check out the links in the description below this video. So one of the functions is going to remain the same, and the other function is going to be uh, time reversed and then shifted through each time, at each offset shift, we're going to multiply the two functions and add up the area. That's what convolution is. We won't go through the whole uh, equation for it here, but I'm just going to draw it for a number of the different time shifts. So we're going to take this function that we're convolving with the square, we reverse the time, which gives us exactly the same because it's symmetric, and then we're going to look at some different time shifts. So here, for example, let's look at one in one interesting time shift. So in this time shift here, we've got the function looking like this, and the overlap here is going to set all of this out here to zero. So all of this is being set to zero when we have this offset in this step of the convolution. And then in here, we're multiplying by one here. And so we're going to be adding up the area. So this is a negative area, and then a positive area, a negative area, a positive area, and because the, these are decreasing, we're starting with a big negative value and all of these other areas are going to be smaller than this one. So we're starting, as we, sh as we have this offset shift here, we're starting with a negative value. So that's where you get this negative value. These are contributing that. This offset here gives you this negative value uh, here, which is an offset just before you're lining up with this function here. So I'll, maybe I should draw out the, the, this function here uh, that we're getting, which is the function that we have, of course, uh, down here. So this function here is the function here. It's the re result of convolving these two functions together. It gives us this one. I'm just redrawing it over here. Of course, notice that there's this negative part here. This negative part here is from this offset here in the convolution. So when the sync function is at this shift, then you get the multiplication of the two and the area is a negative number because there's this part here with the multiplication. When you add up the area, this is a bigger area than this one, bigger than that, bigger than this. So overall it is negative and that's that value there. So let's look at another shift when we're doing the convolution. So the next shift of the convolution, let's look at the one where we've got an exact, uh, our peak is exactly aligned with this value here. Then we've got this offset in our convolution. And in this case, all of this is gonna be multiplied by zero because we're multiplying by that square function. And then when we add up the area, we're adding up all of this area here. So in this case, we are getting half of the area. So this is a this is so the area here is what we're plotting, and the area here is plotting uh, here on the rising part. So that's that value there, 
as it rises up. This is this negative value. This gives us this negative value. This gives us a positive value. So let's look at uh, the next another one across here. Let's look at when we've got the full amount of this big lobe from the sink function and uh, included in the multiplication. So for this shift in the convolution here, we're getting all of this area here when we're multiplying the two and we're adding up the area. And this is the biggest area that we're going to get. So this is the maximum. We're again doing the, we're, I'm just showing the steps of the convolution as the sink function is shifting through. And this is giving us this maximum height up here. And then as it shifts through even further, I'll draw another value of the shift here. As it shifts through even further, for this value here, when we multiply these two functions together, we're going to be getting some positive, some negative, the main lobe, these negatives, these positives in here, and then we're getting two lots of the big negatives, which are going to be cancelling out some of this positive in comparison to this one, which only had one of the negatives within the range of the square function. The other one was outside. So now as it shifts across even more, uh, we get a smaller value because this area here is being counterbalanced by this negative component which has now come in to the range of the square function. So this is going to be giving us these smaller values here. Okay, so this is the visualization of the convolution that's happening to show us why we get this shape in our overall resultant waveform, which is again what's happening if we're cutting off these frequencies because we're convolving in the time domain to give us this. So now let's look at, at this, uh, make this final point about the Gibbs phenomenon about why is it that this peak here does not get smaller as this bandwidth gets wider. And to do this, we need to just take a look at these numbers that are here, the actual values of the sink function. So for the height of, so for the width here, the bandwidth of W, the height here is 2W. And the width of this is 1 divided by 2W. So this width here is 1 divided by 2W. Okay, so this is this is our sync function, and then this sync function here we can see because we've now got a wider bandwidth, we actually have W is higher, so this peak here is now taller. I haven't drawn it that way here in the picture, just through space, but I uh, maybe I'll try to draw it a bit taller here. So this one is, this is a wider bandwidth now, so this is a taller sync function and a narrower sync function because it's 2 times W, where W is the amount of bandwidth. So now we can see what's happening as we do a larger bandwidth. So if we cover a larger bandwidth, then these sync functions here in the convolution are taller because this value of W is bigger. This, the height of the sync function is 2 times W. If you've got a bigger value for W, then your sync function is taller. So the sync functions for wider bandwidths are taller, but they are also narrower. And when you have this, and they're by exactly that scaling. So this is 2W and this is 1 divided by 2W. So when you get this scaling where the amplitude is scaled taller, but the the width of the base is scaled narrower by the same proportion, then the area remains the same. So when you've got this function here, this, this one gives us our maximum, when we compare this one with a narrow bandwidth compared to this one with a wide bandwidth, one of them has the shape that we've shown here, which is the case for the narrow bandwidth, but for the wider bandwidth, this one would be narrower but taller, but the area would be the same. And it is the area from the convolution, it is the area that gives you the height of this output resulting signal. Because when you multiply these two together and then take the area, which is what you do in the convolution, the area remains the same. So in these two cases, the shape of the function is different, but the height of that peak is the same because the area of these two sync functions is the same. And it's because it's doing convolution, it's getting the area. So that explains why the overshoot does not diminish when you include more and more of the frequency terms in your signal. And that is the Gibbs phenomenon. So it's that slightly counterintuitive because you'd think that, uh, just to say it again, you'd think that as the bandwidth increases, that your approximation to the to the, the fundamental to the um, limiting signal, that your approximation would be getting better. 
Now, it is getting better in the sense that these ripples are getting smaller uh, in terms of their effect in the time domain. They're getting smaller, it's getting sharper. It's looking more like a square function, but the overshoot is not getting smaller for this reason, because it's coming about through this convolution. So hopefully this has helped to explain the Gibbs phenomenon and give you more insights into where this overshoot comes from. It comes from this convolution because you're limiting the bandwidth. If it's helped you, please give the video a thumbs up. It helps others to find the video. Uh, subscribe to the channel for more videos and check out the web page in the description below where there's a full categorized list of all of the videos on the channel.